Good afternoon. Scano, nice to see everyone. It's a beautiful Wednesday, Tuesday. Oh, I'm dumb. <laughs> We have a busy week over here in Milton. We've had visitors and and it's really great to see you guys. I look forward to this day. Uh, we have quite a few people that have reached out to Grandmother's Voice that have expressed that they're enjoying this conversation. And so every week, I think it, it just is uh, becoming more comfortable uh, for us to come and sit here and share what we know and what we don't know and resources and just really making space for our community to get together. So I'd like to and just say hello and welcome Andrea of Halton Environmental Network, Wendy Roberts from Sustainable Milton and Kevin Hamilton from McQuiston Urban Farm. And, uh, you know, we began this, this uh, collective, we call it, you know, because as grandmother's voice begins to grow their uh, their community and, you know, our community members are showing up. So many supporters, our Indigenous and non-Indigenous relatives and organizations continue to show up and say, what can we do and how can we, how can we go and get into relationship and really commit to, you know, moving forward together in a good way. This is one of the conversations that we said was really important to have. Um, the environment is so important to us right now and the conversations and, and the things that are happening in the real world. Uh, this is where we thought it would be easy for us to share this conversation and why do it behind closed doors, right? When so many people are asking, you know, how to get involved and where to start. So welcome everyone to our talk today, our environment collective talk. And uh, looks like Kevin just kind of popped out for a sec. I'm sure he'll be back. But maybe until then, we'll just do quick intros again. And then let's talk about our garden planning. I will get things started. So my name is Andrea Rowe, and I am the Director of Sustainable Environments for Halton Environmental Network. So through our programs, we teach people how to uh, grow their own food in a sustainable environmentally friendly manner. And so today's topic is um, really uh, timely um, as we try all of our messages to be, but um, now that we've learned how to start our seeds, it's the next stage in the process is making sure you've got your garden plan um, ready so that you know where to put everything when the ground is ready and the time is right. So I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Jodine. Um, so my name is Wendy Roberts. I'm with Sustainable Milton. We're an organization in Milton with the goal of making uh, Milton a more sustainable community. And a lot of what we're working on um, and learning as we go is um, gardening. Anything from pollinator gardens, vegetable gardens, native seed gardens. Um, so I'm kind of experimenting in my own backyard. Um, but also... Um, we really want to get the what we're calling a community garden at the Italian Cultural Center of Milton uh, really up and flourishing this year. So um, being part of these talks has really pushed me um, in, a, in a lovely direction. Um, so grateful to be here. Thank you. Um, hello, I am Kevin. Uh, I'm working at McQuiston Urban Farm all summer long, all the live long day. Um, and down here we've got uh, A to Z vegetables going and uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be a part of this and keep these conversations going with other motivated and inspired aspiring gardeners and uh, brown thumbs and green thumbs and all thumbs in between. Um, yeah, and uh, today we're going to talk about some crop rotation. Um, and garden planning. Uh, we also have like lots of volunteer things going on down here at McQuest and, and uh, we're trying to get a bit of a list of a crop, um, a group of people that might want to come down and help weed at certain places up uh, in Nelson at Country Heritage Farm there. Is it it's country or county? Country Heritage Park. Country Heritage Park, yes. Yeah, and I think that was, you know, Kevin, that was one of our, I think our initial reasons as well why we got this collective together is because we there's so many far there's so many farms and areas that we need to really keep the property going and that was what so like our partner or you know 
groups, yeah, like this collective has said that, you know, everybody wants to get in it. And then and then that's the part that's the hardest is really maintaining and keeping the weeds and keeping things going. So we really hope that through these conversations, we can continue to connect with people that want to get involved. Look in your neighborhood, ask and, and find out where your community gardens are and ask where your, um, you know, your your best to fit into maintaining and then also keeping in mind that, you know, that really is the the medicine part, I think, of of working in gardens. That's what I like is just being able to go out there and just knowing that it's got a huge purpose, but it's also great for your spirit. That's it. I think that's the best thing we can offer um, is our time and energy as opposed to finances and all that kind of stuff. And then the beautiful thing about going around and visiting other farms is you get to see um, other things in action, learn from other people, and yeah, be able to pick the farmer's brain to some extent. Um, Absolutely. And it's a wonderful way to re-engage in a safe outdoor manner as we're emerging, hopefully one day from COVID, um, that this is a great way to reconnect with neighbors, meet new friends, meet new people, learn from each other, and uh, contribute to uh, some food security programs within the community as well. So we've got three community gardens. Wendy's got one up in Milton. So there's lots of opportunities for people to get involved, even if it's just for one time to come out um, or on a regular basis. Please get in touch with us and get involved. And there's a huge demand. I, I was um, saw you know on, on Facebook and people who I think living in apartments are desperate for just even a small plot. Um, and, and like there had to be 12 or 13 just said, you know, where can we go? Where can we go? And I know there's a wait list uh, for the two gardens, the two community gar other two community gardens in Milton. So uh, people are interested for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's at least a 200 person uh, wait list long for the Oakville allotment gardens and something similar in Burlington. So there are lots of church gardens, um, community gardens, lots of ways for people to get involved. And I'm finding that the more I talk to newcomers as well, um, that come from agricultural backgrounds, they want to contribute. They want to get their hands back in the dirt. They have knowledge. They might just not know how to translate that to our climate. So they're willing to learn and contribute as well. Yeah. That's a perfect segue into what we're talking about. Uh, I was just thinking, a lot of folks that have very limited space and maybe not even soil actually to plant in, but that container gardening, um, that is definitely one strategy of planning what you're going to grow. So if you're in a really small space, um, thinking of all the things that you can grow up uh, outside of a wall or on a trellis. Um, and so originally the like safe for something like peppers, uh, I know a lot of the big greenhouse operations have gone back to peppers used to grow on vines up in the in the jungles in um, South America and that. And so there are, you can manipulate peppers to grow like that, or you can get varieties that are more of a vine type variety and you can just grow one liter and they go up and down and up and down and grow. I've seen 40 foot cherry tomato vines. Um, in some greenhouses that they just keep on trellising up on wires and down and down. Yep. So there's a, those are great things. So if you are in a small space or just have a small backyard or there's too much shade and you only have like one sunny spot against the wall on the side of your house or wherever, um, definitely think about growing things like um Cucumbers will trellis and you can keep them going all year long. Uh, put them in containers on your balconies, uh, like really big uh, eight gallon or more pots kind of thing is, is good size. Tomatoes, um, you can, there's strategies that we can show later on in the season of how to sucker and uh, keep them pruned so they're just growing up. One, um, what else do we have? Beans. Are good ones that you can trellis there's runner beans that will grow long binding types and so with all these things like uh just look at there's bush varieties of uh different plant families and then um vining ones so cucumbers are another good one um there isn't one called malabar or 
New Zealand spinach, which grows all season long and gives you a spinach type leaf. That's another good trellising one. Um, what else do we trellis, everyone? Um, Can you trellis some melons? Yeah. The cantaloupe? Yeah. Definitely, definitely a good one too. And like with all these things, like uh, a lot of the cucurbit family, we're going to talk families in a minute. Cucurbits are your uh, cucumbers, your watermelons, your melons, your um, bitter, bitter melon is the, the other one I think of. Um, they are all trellisers. And with the melons, you do need to support them a little bit. So when the melons are actually hanging, they're pretty strong, but uh, I've just, I've, I've seen a lot of people just put sticks up and, and things to support the melons when they're hanging. But yeah, you can get a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of food in very small spaces. Um, doing your, uh, make a hammock for them, exactly. Um, you can do them with, uh, uh, sal salad mix is a good one too, because you can put a lot of seeds and that's a cut and come back kind of uh, crop. So you usually get three cuts off of that, arugula, these tiny and, and you can do those in uh, tinier, smaller planters, like those ones that are maybe uh, four to six inches deep and long. Um, and you can hang them off the side of your balcony too. Um, those are all good things. Um, yeah, as, as far as strategies of planting your garden, there's something called crop rotation, which just means moving things around in your garden. So I got a chalkboard here and I have all the plant families. Um, but if this was your, if that was your garden last summer and you had, uh, I'll just use letters, but these for brassica. So your brassica family is, um, that's the biggest one. And that is also the one family that does not have a symbiotic relationship with fungus in the soil. So, uh, and we talked about fungus earlier. You can buy inoculant to start your seedlings, and the more fungus you have uh, in your root zone, the more fungal biomass you have, the more nutrients are going to be made available from what's already in your soil. Um, but that brassica family is one of the biggest ones, and it doesn't have that relation, but that's your turnips, your rutabagas, your kale, your cabbage, your cauliflower, your broccoli, radishes. Uh, it's a lot of the food, your pak choys, bok choys, all those kinds of things. Um, and everywhere in the on the planet that I have been, and the, I've only not been to one continent, um, there is flea beetles, which is a pest that is very common. And so the problem with planting say, anything in the same spot is you're going to have those pests coming up every year. So if I have my brassicas here, I might try and plant them in the exact opposite side of my garden. And if you're in a backyard garden, it, you're gonna have less success with this for pests because all the flea beetles are gonna overwinter in the soil. And then when they come up in the spring, it's a little different on my farm because if I have, if I had an acre then, and I did them on opposite corners, it's gonna take them two, three, four days to find out that the brassicas are down here now. So it's for overwintering pests that hang out in the soil, uh, that's a way to kind of slow them down before they find your crop. They're always going to find it. But the other reason that you're going to be moving things is uh, to break disease pressure. So whatever diseases, sometimes they're soil-borne diseases, sometimes they come in on the jet stream, but you want to move, rotate your crops to break the disease pressure in certain parts of your um, garden. Tomato, which is this fancy word here, Solanacea family. Um, that's your nightshade family is the other term uh, that people will use. And that is your tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes. Um, some of my favorite vegetables, they all go nice together in things. And tomatoes are especially susceptible to soil borne diseases. Um, so it's definitely great to rotate those around and not plant them in the same spots. Um, there is, a, I'll just mention this and people could research this. Again, Google is our friend um, in, um, or any other alternative search engine. I'm actually not a big fan of Google. That's another story. 
Uh, but they, you know, go online. You can find all this information out with uh, in regards to companion planting and um, rotating things around. But in Europe, there is a big push in a lot of greenhouse operations because they don't want to be rotating stuff around, and they have lucrative businesses uh, around cucumber production, around pepper production. They will plant year after year after year after year at the same soil and figure if they can grow plants that can resist the diseases, then all the better. So that's a, another philosophy, I would say, but generally in organic agriculture, we are um, rotating things around. But I just thought I would mention that because if you are in a tight space and you can't, you have to put your tomatoes back in the same space, like on year three or year four, or you just don't have an option because um, you love tomatoes and you want to fill your whole backyard, then there is that kind of strategy you can go for um, and read into it. And uh, yeah, let me know how that goes because it makes sense to me. But uh, if you have the space, it's certainly much easier to just to rotate things around. So I'm just going to add on to that, Kevin. So people in backyard gardens that maybe don't have the luxury of uh, a full crop rotation plan, even on, at the square foot gardening level, there are still ways to manage this. And, you know, adding new compost and extra nutrients in because one, there, I guess there's a couple of reasons why we want to talk about um, crop rotation. One is nutrient exhaustion from the soil. So the same type of plant over and over again is going to be needing the same nutrients from that soil to produce healthy fruit. So if you exhaust the soil without adding anything back in, it's not good for the soil, it's not good for your plants, it's not good for human health. The second that you're talking about right now is the plant and um, disease or the, the pests and the diseases that can um, become problematic. So if you're going to plant the same thing in the same spot, you just have to be a little bit more vigilant as well around inspecting your plants and um, being on top of any infestations that you might notice. Absolutely, that's a great point in observational, uh, really get down and look at your plants. I know like the, the one of the biggest problems with the tomato family with that soil borne disease is that when it rains so two things if you're looking really close and you see this little white fly and they're really hard to see but if you get in really close you can see this little white fly that gets in and it bites your plant around the stalk and then right where that bite happens now it's an open sore and that's the vector for the pathogens to get in so when it rains and water splashes on your plant then you have that sore so one way to combat that is you can do foliar sprays so we were talking about compost teas earlier or there's fish emulsion, there's certain uh, fertility product that you can buy and you dilute it with water and you can use, um, you can use a, a backpack sprayer or just get one of these spray bottles from Dollarama or whatever and put your compost tea or your fish stuff or your kelp or your seaweed, liquid seaweed, that kind of stuff. And then you just mist uh, your plants and that is like, it creates a biofilm over those little bites where those bugs are. And then you can have uh, like a, it's like a scab. Um, and that will also help. Or you can do like a 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, dilution. And that's another good way to, with your cucumbers, with everything. Um, and yeah, look for those, uh, those pests there. Um, what was my other point? Yes, with uh, putting the fertility back in the soil. Like I, I've been farming for 21 years and I'm really trying to get all the micronutrients and the macronutrients. So there's 88 minerals you can get. The more compost and stuff that you can put in, the more biology you can encourage in your soil, the better off you're going to be. And if your plant's getting everything it needs, it will generally fight off all those pests and not be susceptible to disease. So those are great points. Um, uh, vermicompost is really good stuff to get in your soil as well. Um, I'll just go over these these families real quick too. So you've got the nightshade family we talked about, the cucurbits, the uh, your pickles, pumpkin or pumpkin squash, eggplant. Um, sorry, pickles, pumpkin squash, cucumbers, um, and melons. And then um, the the legume family, which is that fabasia. That's legume. So that's all your beans. That's nitrogen fixer. So if you can move all those things around, 
That's great. Allium is another family, which is all your uh, garlic and chives and onions and those kinds of flavors. Um, can you tilt your camera down just a little so we can see your chalkboard a little yes. better? Absolutely. Amazing. There we go. Yep. So that's the allium family. That's all your garlic and onions and stuff. Um, and then the carrot family, uh, umbellifera. That's your carrots and uh, dill and fennel. Um, Chenopod is the other one, which is a uh, spinach and what else is in that family? Beets. Um, those are the biggies. And yeah, so those are, those are all your families and it's good to rotate them around. And again, if you're putting fertility in your soil and, uh, then you should be okay. The other thing is if you're doing, um, like we now are triple cropping and double cropping our soils here and but we're adding plenty of organic matter and trying to get that biological activity happening in our soil by bubbling uh with uh with an aeration uh air stone or the your aquarium pumps we're making a tea that bubbles for 18 to 24 hours with our compost and if we have good compost good living compost then we're going to be feeding the soil when we water our plants or we're going to be spraying our plants, giving them those nutrients with a foliar spray. And by making, by make, having nutrients in that compost tea that get into the soil or get on the foliar spray of the plant, that plant, when it's healthy, there's exudates, which is a fancy way of saying it's producing food that it puts out through the roots to feed the soil microorganisms. Mm -hmm. So when you're, a lot of people say feed the soil, not the plant. But it's a good combination of both that will really help you in the long run. For you took the words right out of my mouth. You know, it's you got to put the nutrients back into the soil, make them available for the plant. So feed the soil, not the plant. You don't want to just sprinkle on your uh, fertilizer pellets and uh, and hope for the best. You got to feed that whole microorganism uh, level too. Can I interrupt for a second? I just had a special guest come in and he said he'd like to say hi because he was, well, he was walking by. But uh, Isaac Murdoch's with us today. Hi, everybody. At our center. Today's Hello. our, our Hello. planning day. This is Kevin from Equestin Farm. He might be, he might come out tomorrow night. He's hey, one Kevin. of our lead farmers. Whoa. Right on. And uh, today we're talking about uh, the, the planning and you know how to plant plant with what and Beautiful. yeah we started this collective with our community in in Halton so Andrea is from the Halton Environment Network nice. and then Wendy was here last night she's one of our volunteers as well Wonderful. and she's with Sustainable Milton so we're talking about you know creating this collective so that you know the gardens can be tended to and we have it we're you know just kind of taking care of each other amazing that's amazing well hello everybody Hello, nice yeah. What are you doing here? And I wish you all the best best of luck. Likewise, yeah. Hopefully I'll get out to see you tomorrow. That'd be great. Okay, thanks mm -hmm. everybody. Thanks, Isaac. Okay. Take care. Um I, I just see a question here in the comments there, uh Curtis. Uh what to use to remove oil and gas from the soil? What kind of product? Um fungus is amazing stuff the more fungal activity you can get in your soil. So there is inoculants that you can get at uh, a lot of garden stores. The cannabis industry, there's a lot of little gardener garden stores that have popped up that cater to the cannabis. And just go in there and talk vegetables with them. Um, they're, they've created, with the cannabis industry, now they've created a lot of soil gurus and people that know soil biology uh, for growing those plants. But there's really no difference between vegetables and uh, cannabis and I mean just all those living plants they all have roots and they all need microorganisms and they all need good biology so avoiding any of the um, inorganic fertilizers the chemical stuff that are, are all salts which is not good for the soil and it kills all the microbes but if you can get um, some of these inoculants I don't have one on hand uh, mycorrhizal fungi inoculant um, if you go into any of these stores and ask for that, uh, getting, putting any plant in there is good. Um, and 
the fungus will start to break those complex hydrogen or the carbon chains and be able to pull apart a lot of that. Like I know what Michael or uh, what's his name, Paul Stamets, he's a huge uh, mycologist, uh, mushrooms, and they took piles, three piles of petrochemical soaked uh, soil and they inoculated one with beneficial bacteria, uh, one with, um, oh, then, then they had their control pile and then they did one they inoculated with oyster mushrooms, which is just kind of a run of the mill average mushroom that is in production. And it broke up all that oil and gas and, and petrochemicals. And then when the mushrooms came up, birds came down and then they started to eat, feed and then poop their seeds. And then at the end of it, the two stinky piles of petrochems were totally gross with the beneficial bacteria and the control. And the last one had was brimming with life. All this uh, plants and stuff came up. There are whole industries that deal with uh, brown soil remediation. And I find it fascinating that something as humble as a mushroom can potentially be the solution to all of this. Um, I would caution <laughs> anyone who's dealing with contaminated soil to make sure that you do get anything tested before consuming the product. But uh, it's amazing and lots of research out there that can be um, discovered and uh, and applied to different situations. So if you type in Paul Stamets, um, Michael Medicinals is one of the companies that he makes uh, mushroom supplements for human consumption. Um, they also sell, I believe, bio bags, which uh, when there's floodwaters and stuff, you can put these sandbag kind of things um, to along rivers and that. Um, and there is mushrooms and things growing in there that help break down any pollution that's coming from upstream. And yeah, he's doing some amazing stuff. Yeah, and I agree. I do like this, the simplest solutions, the humble little, it's the reason we're here, um, mushrooms, because uh, that broke down all the soils way back when. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Paul Stamets, that's right. Just did a quick little internet search. <laughs> oh, cool, yeah. He's, he is the guru. If, if anybody gets his book, uh, he's got a few out, but Mycelium Running, and then he does a mushroom growing handbook. And uh, yeah, it is an earth-saving revolution. He, it's it, fungus. Mushrooms are the answer. Trees are the answer. Those are great bumper stickers to slap on your car. Because, <laughs> yeah, trees are going to clean up our carbon. And, and all that fungus exists symbiotically on the roots of the trees. And it's sharing. Fungus is a hollow tube through the soil. And it moves nutrients and creates, it chelates uh, in the crystalline structures of all our sand, silt, and clays. And breaks that up and makes it um, biologically available for our plants. So it's really powerful stuff. And it's... Uh, you know, you just need moisture and you need inoculant. Um, yeah. And it's great for our, our, our gardens, absolutely. So, yeah, I hope this helps everyone. It was a quick... Uh, so wrap. let's talk about now that we know what the families of plants, what the broad categories are, um, how do we plan for what follows what in the cycle of things? Because I know that... Uh, you know, in square foot gardening or different other smaller space methodologies, they want you to move from square one to two to three to four. Beans can go anytime, but, you know, just talk us through some of the, the methodology of why we follow certain crops with others and why it's important to start thinking about that if we're starting a new garden or planning our garden for this upcoming season. Now that we've got our seeds started on our little paper towels and maybe we've potted some of them up, now we need to know when they go into the ground, where do we put them? And if we think about it now, we can save ourselves a lot of headache um, later on when we find out, oh, maybe we forgot to think about something. So yes, talk us through the planning process. So here, I'm just gonna write a few things here. Um, heavy feeders. So basically all your root crops are light feeders. There's debate on what's heavy and what's not. The only thing that I have seen that is a medium feeder, dependably, is um, peppers. For whatever reason, peppers are always listed as medium feeders and they're the only ones. So your heavy feeders are your cukes, zooks, tomatoes, um, 
broccoli, cauliflower. Um, those are some of the heavies. What else? Um, and heavy feeder meaning they need lots of nutrients. So basically I joke that, or, you know, tongue in cheek, say you could plant zucchinis in a bag of compost or manure, and they would be perfectly happy to just live there because they've got lots and lots of nutrients available to them, as opposed to light feeders, which aren't as um, greedy when it comes to the amount of nutrients that they need, because they're not producing that fruit and then having to grow that fruit really large. Yeah, exactly. Anything that has a fruit on it is generally, yeah, a heavy feeder. Um, legumes being like beans are the only ones that produce a fruit and bean is a fruit. Anything fruit is defined as having seeds on the inside. Um, so beans would be the exception of a fruit, uh, but nobody calls beans a fruit. So unless you're doing that rhyme, beans, beans, the magical fruit. Anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, then I would follow my, so cucumbers, generally people don't get cucumbers lasting the whole season. So if you get them in, like you could say plant a lettuce in the spring. And then as soon as it's done, I would cut the lettuce out this far below the ground, leave the roots in the ground to one, if there's fungus on them, it's going to keep them alive there. And then I would plant my cucumber in either direct seed or a little transplant. Transplants will give you a bit of a boost. And then you could put, follow that lettuce with a cucumber because now you're back into heavy feeder. And you can always side dress, put a little bit of compost in and around and incorporate it. And then when your cukes are done, you could go back to another light feeder. I transplant beets and stuff in the fall or I'll transplant... Um, kohlrabi okay i'll transplant um what else uh turnips all a lot of the brassica families you can transplant so you can just go from light to heavy feeder and then you could get a third timeline of something light that's like 50 days that you've already have growing this much in a plug four weeks before you're ready so you want to have those timelines where you have uh four weeks of growth in a seed plug so your plant will be like anywhere between three to six inches tall, and then you can plant in. Um, the only, the only, the heavy feeders that are leaves are things like kale, Swiss chard, things that give all season long um, are often heavy feeders too. So yeah, your, your, your light feeders would be all your root crops and your lettuces, um, leafy greens, stuff like that, arugula, um, yeah, and it's, it's important to know that too, because if you over fertilize something that's not intended to take a lot of nutrients, um, you can cause them to bolt too soon. Or in the case of carrots, they'll fork or come all knobbly, which Correct. doesn't affect how they taste. But if you're looking to do um, a farmer's market, they might not be your best sellers, or maybe they will be your best sellers. I don't know. You just get some interesting carrots. Uh, from overfeeding. Yeah, carrots tend to fork and then you get those like octopus, yeah. <laughs> octopi. <laughs> the, the walking men carrots, so, yeah. And some people love that. Um, kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, so those definitely like beans and stuff like that, I don't put lots of fertility in. Um, again, the biology is more important, I would argue, um, hands down than fertility, and that is not common knowledge. This is like new soil science that we're just starting to figure out. The soil we extract from is under the monster musky. Good soil. <laughs> yeah, if you have uh, access to fish too, yeah, and you can put that in your compost, that is amazing stuff. Some people take that fish waste and they will ferment it in buckets. Um, and it, you think it would be smelly, but when you ferment it with a few um, like molasses or simple sugars in there, you can make amazing, amazing biologically rich and uh, complete. Uh, foliar sprays and and then dilute that um, into your garden soil. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, Curtis, but yeah, fish waste is amazing. And if you know anybody that is local doing fish, um, that is gold, and they're usually just chucking it. So it's a it's a free it's essentially a free gift um, to make your garden amazing. 
My great grandfather always used to toss uh, the leftover fish uh, byproduct after a meal into his rose garden and his veggie garden and always had award-winning gardens. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many things we can do. And I, I'm a big fan of experimenting because like a lot of our, our weeds are more nutritious than our annual plants. And really quickly, I just have this, this theory that we're eating mostly annual plants, things that grow once, give us like a broccoli and then it's done. And I think that might have something to do with our, our lack of long-term thinking. We're always eating so many annual plants and not these perennials that have the deeper nutrition and then we don't have maybe that connection. That's just my theory, but, um, oh, where was I going with that? Uh, uh, I don't know, but while you think about that, we're trying to start a food forest in Oakville because I've been very, uh, I don't know, this whole world of permaculture, it seems so mysterious. And yet at the same time, it's so obvious that why aren't we planting more fruit trees and berry bushes that we can harvest like from April through till the frost instead of water intensive annual crops. So it's certainly an area where I've been doing a lot of um, learning and studying and uh, the town has given us a very large parcel of land. So if anyone wants to get involved um, in that project, if you've got knowledge, want to learn alongside with us, it's another uh, another area for sure that we can explore. Yeah, permaculture, permanent agriculture. Yeah, all our brambles, our berries and fruit trees and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, I was going to say that a lot of that, those... Uh, weeds that are more nutritious than that and they have, every plant has a carrying capacity and wants certain types of minerals in certain amounts but we would just take a lot of the big bigger weeds that we're pulling out of our garden and or in and around you can just chop them down with a scythe or something and then i beat it up a bit with a, a big rock to break the cell structure of the the ligaments in the stalk or the the leaves and then I'd stick it in, a, I'd, I'd make a compost tea with it. And then all of a sudden you're getting nutrients from all those weeds. And then if I had like a bed that, I mean, I'm farming, so it's, you could just do one plant in your backyard or you could do 10 plants in the beginnings of your rows and I'll do foliar sprays and just see how they grow. Observation is the first hammock time. It's the first principle of permaculture. Second principle is more hammock time, observing and watching. And Nick, by experimenting like this, you'll learn things. Uh, and you know, one plant might go yellow. I'm like, Ooh, geez, what did I put? What weed or what? You know, like there's different, like anything near black walnuts. Uh, only allium family, the onions and stuff will grow near those because it acidifies the soil. And there's allelopathic effects that inhibit germination. So, anyways, yeah, and then observe, experiment, have fun. Can I ask? Um, do you ever plant? Uh, a friend of mine was saying you know, in your pollinator patch, plant vegetables and, and plant pollinators between um, your vegetables. So that was one of my questions. And also, Andrea, you had referred to the square foot gardening. And so my question is, I've heard about, you know, plant in triangles, plant square foot, plant in rows. Any comments on any of those? I, uh, so the square foot gardening method is not necessarily around the shape of your garden patch, although it can be, but it's more around understanding the size of the fully grown plant. So within a one foot by one foot square patch, how many mature plants will fit? So typically one mature tomato plant, how many, um, you know, 16 bean plants. So there's calculations around an average fully matured plant and how much space it needs to grow and how many um, can be supported by the soil. I love interplanting with pollinator plants because then you're bringing the pollinators right to where you're growing your food and some will attract beneficial um, pests as well that will attack pests that might attack your vegetables. So um, dill, um, Oh, I can't even think of. So some will attract pollinators, mm -hmm. eat the pests. There we go. And some will repel the pests. So marigolds, anything with a really strong smell will repel things that might otherwise attack your vegetables. So that's part of the companion planting, intercropping. Uh, there's lots of different terms for, um, for doing it as opposed to monocultures, 
where you're just planting right. lots of the same thing mm -hmm. in one spot. I love to just, it, it makes it beautiful. It um, produces the biodiversity of, of insects that you need for your plants as well. Does that answer that question? Yeah. And then, yeah. Yep, and then some flowers last all season long. So if it's in the middle of your bed, then you have that root mass that if it's inoculated and has that fungus, it's going to share with all the new roots that come in. And if you're mm -hmm. popping things out and then transplanting things in because you're double cropping, then you'll always have that intact soil with that fungal biomass. Um, yeah, diversity is key. The more yeah. you can mix things up. I know like onions go good with uh, carrots because there's a carrot rust fly that eats the top of your carrots and they'll repel that carrot mm -hmm. rust fly. And yeah, definitely put flowers yeah, and in your beds. I, and, yeah. Exactly. And it allows you to get things in nice and close to your plant that maybe don't require as much sunlight. So the, the principle, I guess, yeah. is to not leave bare soil. So you want to plant lower growing things underneath some of your taller plants as well so that there's no soil erosion. I know we're running out of time, Jody. <laughs> so um, yeah, research um, what companion plants are and what are some of the combatant plants. So whether there's um, like Kevin was mentioning with the black walnut, there are some plants where you've got a combative um, uh, soil, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Chemicals. Yeah. Different compounds that. Thank you. Yeah, compounds. <laughs> that are detrimental to other crops. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, those are all good suggestions for sure. So yeah. So, yeah. Jody, I, I see that you're back. Um, there aren't any questions or comments shall we wrap this up or do you have any closing thoughts as well kevin about crop rotation no. planning? the conversation you guys can see the conversation that's been happening in the chat a lot of great information here uh we've been having our own conversations in the background too around it um so good content what amazing group exciting to get planting the sun is shining here now i feel like looking outside is just it's ready but this and weekend I, I, our group is gathering so we're getting ready my eggplant egg you were right be patient <laughs> uh -huh, never give up <laughs> good things take time the eggs work very well <laughs> amazing and yes right, the fungus so a, is among us natalie yeah i like that <laughs> fungus is among us. I love it. Yeah. So let's go get planting, everyone. Like Curtis says, how exciting. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nyawa, for joining us and Nyawa for supporting our learning, my friends. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are in the Halton or in the GTA area, Isaac Murdoch is here to speak uh, about the, his revolution of the heart. And uh, we, he's got a guest with him and uh, we're really excited to have them in our space. Last night was a really beautiful gathering and uh, we were very excited to find out that, that uh, Isaac woke up and thought that he should plant, uh, paint our center. So we are so honored that he's here going to, uh, to paint his picture of uh, Josephine the water walker on our wall at the center and mm -hmm. last night was wonderful. So we look forward to hopefully seeing everyone on, uh, on Wednesday night here at country heritage park. And uh, we'll see you then. Thank you, Jody. For hosting. We also, for, I forgot. We also have our, our fair this weekend. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. Our indigenous fair where we'll be doing some planting of our seedlings too with our, our uh, young ones. So you're more than welcome to come and visit for that as well. Friday, 12 to 8, and then Saturday from 10 till 6. So we'll see you. See you next week. Bye, everybody.